Do you want to know the bone health habits that changed my life and helped me to reverse osteoporosis? I have 13 habits to tell you about. 13 is not an unlucky number. Hi, I'm Glory B. When I was a freshman in high school, toward the end of the school year, I tried out for the pom-pom squad for the following school year. Freshmen hardly ever made it. For tryouts, they gave all of us numbers to attach to our t-shirts. I was given number 13. Oh yeah, it's a good thing I'm not superstitious. I happily wore number 13 and made it on the pom bomb squad. We were called pom berets because we wore berets. From then on, I never hesitated about the number 13. And 13 is the number of bone health habits I took on that changed my life. When I was 59, I was diagnosed with osteoporosis. I reversed it by the time I was 61, and I reversed it naturally without the bone drugs. Even though my doctor tried to convince me to take the drugs, I was like, did you just meet me? I had already done the research and determined the drugs weren't for me. So here are the bone health habits I used to reverse it. The first habit is keeping my vitamin D levels at a higher level than most doctors suggest. And they don't suggest it because most of them don't know better. The doctors I follow suggest a higher level and I'm enrolled in a vitamin D study where my blood is tested twice a year and I can go online and see the results. This has helped me know how much vitamin D3 supplement to take. I like to keep my vitamin D level at now it's like 70 to 85 NGML, which is nanograms per milliliter. Dr. Jill Furman was one of the first doctors I heard saying, if you're going to take a vitamin D3 supplement, you've got to have your blood tested regularly for vitamin D. Otherwise, you really don't know how much supplement to take. I've noticed in my test results when I've been in high stress mode, taking my normal amount of D3, that the vitamin D level in my blood dips down. So now when I know my stress levels are high, I add more vitamin D supplement. This is the only way I know how much supplement I need to take. Vitamin D is an important part of overall health and high immunity in addition to bone health, which the vitamin D study I'm enrolled in is finding. If you'd like to look into joining the study yourself, the link will be in the description box below the video and in the first comment. Vitamin D3 is fat soluble, so make sure when you take it that you're also taking a fat at the same time. I usually eat a nut, such as an almond or a cashew when I take D3. I also make sure that my supplementation includes vitamin K2. While vitamin D3 stimulates your body's uptake of dietary and supplemental calcium and blood calcium levels, vitamin K2 redirects the calcium from soft tissue into the bones. The foods which have the highest amount of K2 in them are heart healthy, however, like beef, salami, and cheese. So a simple K2 supplement works well for me. My second good bone habit is supplementing with vitamin B12. Now, since I eat a heart healthy diet and have no comorbidities at the age of 64, it means I'm not eating meat or cheese. Because of that, I supplement with vitamin B12. During annual physicals with a blood test, I have them add on a test for vitamin B12. One time the result said I was taking too much. The type I take is now in a small capsule, which I like better than the tablet because those little tablets tend to disintegrate in the bottle. The little capsules I take now only need to be taken two days a week and my vitamin B12 levels are fine. Now for me, having the right level of vitamin B12 ensures the rest of my body is working properly. If I don't feel well, then I won't exercise and do all the physical activities I need to do in order to have good bone health. I habitually take a vitamin B12 supplement twice a week. My third bone health habit that was a game changer was buying mostly fresh produce at the grocery store. Sometimes as I'm pulling up to the checkout, I glance in my cart and it's a cornucopia of fruit and vegetables. In the summer, you can do the same at the farmer's market. 
such a great habit to get into eating mostly fresh produce. And this is an overall good health habit that's not just for bone health. One of the best things I drop for my diet is dairy. That includes milk and cheese. Now, it's hard to get away from it at restaurants, but it's entirely possible. Milk doesn't do a body good. All of those marketing messages lie to us. This is my fourth good bone habit I adopted that not only was good for my bones, but also for my overall health. I get calcium from non-dairy sources, such as broccoli and dark leafy greens, which includes kale, collard greens, turnip greens, beet greens, Swiss chard, and other vegetables, including acorn squash, butternut squash, sweet potatoes, bok choy, and cabbage. Even some fruits contain calcium. I'll leave links for you in the description box to these lists. I've even used a large collard green leaf, cut out the stem, and used it as a wrap. Now, some people use a large romaine lettuce leaf as a wrap, but I found that romaine lettuce tends to break and create a messy wrap sandwich. The collard green leaves are much better as a nutritious wrap alternative. I have several links for you to do more research about dairy, and they're all listed and linked in the description box and first comment. Please read them. Among these studies and articles, I have a PubMed article, which is a study that concludes quote, that a greater intake of milk and dairy products was not associated with a lower risk of osteoporosis and hip fracture, unquote. So I've also supplemented with the Garden of Life Grill Bone System, which is a more affordable option to the similar algae kill supplements. The Grill Bone System has two different supplements, and one of them is an algae-based calcium. Once I reached osteopenia, I cut in half the normal dosage of the calcium supplement. And for those of you who are afraid to take calcium, first of all, the type of calcium you take is important. Second, if you're concerned, we discussed several times, you can get a cardiac calcium CT score scan to see if you have a problem. Dr. Shostak and I each had this scan done less than a year ago as I'm filming this, and I'll link that video for you so you can see what the scan is like, and you can also find out our score results. My fifth good bone health habit that changed things for the better is getting protein from non-animal sources. First of all, the whole where you get your protein is such a fantastic myth, and that question, where do you get to your protein, came from a highly successful marketing plan which pushes animal-based products for profit. Look, I'm an accountant by trade, and accountants as well as attorneys are all about facts and evidence. For me, it's long-term evidence, and all the people I've been following since 1998, especially those who are older than I am, who've been eating this way for much longer, are thriving. If you want to follow two or three people to see what they're doing on Instagram, follow Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, and follow his daughter, Jane Esselstyn, where you can also find Caldwell's wife, Ian Esselstyn, on both Instagram accounts. I'll hotlink their accounts in the description box. Dr. Esselstyn is 90 years old as I'm filming, and is a little younger. They are thriving. Jane will film her father biking through their neighborhood, and not a leisurely old man bike ride. I mean, looking like he's in a race. So, where do you get your protein from other sources? Well, from beans, lentils, tofu, which I don't like. I don't like tofu. <laughs> Edamame, which is soybeans, and I like those. Green peas, raw nuts and seeds, quinoa, and nutritional yeast, which I use in several recipes. Many other vegetables have some protein too. I'm not protein deficient. I also don't have the comorbidities that other people have, even in my own family, that are associated with animal food intake. Now, what are comorbidities? They're high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. Someone who eats a plant-based diet wrote an article I read, and in it, she wrote that while talking with her brother, who ate the standard American diet, 
and who she thought had high blood pressure, he told her he doesn't have high blood pressure. And she said, well, wait a minute. I thought you had high blood pressure. And her brother said, well, I take medication for high blood pressure. So now I don't have it. <laughs> Here is some news. If you take medication for any of the comorbidities I listed, then you have that comorbidity. I want to show you a clip that Dr. Esselstyn posted to his Instagram account where he was doing an interview via Zoom and they were talking about the fact that he also doesn't add oil to his food. You'll hear his wife, Ann, in the background. It's hilarious. And based no oil diet or do you have some oil? I <laughs> We don't want to have it in the house. No oil. Dr. Esselstyn, thank you so much for joining. Well, changing to a whole food plant-based diet, you could either halt or stop heart disease. There's going to be a seismic revolution in health. It's never going to come about through the invention of another drug, stent, or bypass. You speak about making yourself heart attack proof. It's so exciting to think that you can exchange one pile of delicious food that is absolutely destroying you for another pile of delicious food that absolutely will save their lives, not only from heart disease, but also from stroke, from diabetes, from hypertension, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. I mean, it's as if the heavens have opened and given the medical profession a tool that is incomparable in our belt. I just love Ann Esselstyn. My sixth good bone health habit is eating magnesium-rich foods. Magnesium and calcium work together in the body to build healthy bones. Now, ideally, your intake through food and supplementation in milligrams should be the same amount for magnesium as it is for calcium. I've linked one study and one article about magnesium and bone health so that you can get more details if you wish. The foods rich in magnesium will sound familiar. Beans, nuts and seeds, greens such as spinach, Swiss chard and collard greens, whole greens such as quinoa and oats, and other vegetables like green peas, corn and potatoes, and fruit such as bananas, papaya, blackberries, and avocados. Most of these foods I've already mentioned for the other habits and benefits. So we have a double whammy here. Number seven in my good bone health habits is getting plenty of vitamin C from the foods I eat. You might be wondering how vitamin C helps bones be healthy. Well, vitamin C is a water-soluble antioxidant in your body. Osteoporosis can occur from oxidative damage to your bone cells. Good antioxidants help your bone cells protect themselves. Vitamin C is an excellent anti-inflammatory, which is great for your immune system to use to be proactive against oxidative damage. I don't take a vitamin C supplement. I did that a few times in my early 20s. I got colds anyway, and then I just stopped taking it. Now I just get it from food, and the foods high in vitamin C are citrus fruits such as oranges, lemons, limes, and grapefruit, cruciferous vegetables such as broccoli, kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and cauliflower, bell peppers, tomatoes, strawberries, lemons, papaya, kiwi, and potatoes. So a lot is out there and ready for your grocery cart. All of this information about food might seem daunting. When I first learned about it 26 years ago, it seemed like a lot, but I broke it down into doable portions. Some of my friends and family tried to do what I did, and a couple of them succeeded, but most of them didn't. They got discouraged and quit. And for most of them, their health has suffered. And I understand it. Food is emotional. I wanted to help people change their food habits successfully so that they remain encouraged throughout the entire process. Losing weight, gaining energy, feeling better, getting off medications, and looking better. To do that, I created a course called Kickstart Your Health, which helps you take steps at your own pace to make changes one at a time so that you stay encouraged, stick to it, learn to love the new food, and learn to love the new you. The course has videos, PDF files you can download and either print or use on a screen, and a recipe book to get you started on new habits for shopping, cooking, and eating. 
I'll have the link to the Kickstart course in the description box and first comment. Or you can go to my website, glorybee-tv.com, and in the menu bar, click Courses. My eighth good habit for excellent bone health is low caffeine consumption. I don't drink coffee. In the home I grew up in, we drank a lot of Coke and Pepsi, though. I stopped drinking colas sometime during college. Some studies have linked caffeine intake to bone loss. I do drink tea, but liquid, ounce for ounce tea, doesn't have nearly the amount of stimulant in it as coffee and cola. I do drink decaf espresso with almond milk, so my latte, but I buy the espresso myself and I make it myself, so I know it's really decaf. In Dr. Clapper's article that I linked, he calls caffeine a calcium thief when consumed in large amounts, over 300 milligrams per day, which would be about three cups of strong coffee. Basically, caffeine interferes with the body's absorption of calcium. The ninth bone health habit is to drink very little alcohol. The healthiest people I know don't drink any alcohol. This includes all of the doctors and others associated with the National Health Association. I, on the other hand, maybe have one or two glasses of wine a week. As with several of these bone health habits, I've linked to a study for you to look further into alcohol consumption and bone health. My 10th bone health habit that changed my life is in the exercise category. And this is adding jumping to my workout routine three days a week. I talked about this in previous videos showing how I jump and linking to a study done several years ago where they saw the best amount of bone density increase for women who jump 20 times during an exercise session and not jumping 20 times in a row, but jumping once, waiting a bit, in their case, waiting 30 seconds, and then jumping again. Now, I do the jumps in between all of my other exercises while wearing gym shoes and on a hard floor surface. This impactful exercise was a real key to improving my bone density, and I made sure it became a regular habit. As another excellent bone health habit, number 11 is weightlifting and other resistance exercises. I do these in addition to jumping, but for many women, the jumping exercise isn't possible because of a physical limitation, such as their knees, ankles, or feet. So lifting weights and doing resistance exercises are the next types of exercises you can do in addition to things like heel drops and march walking. I put together some videos showing how you can do these at home with a few pieces of equipment or no equipment. When we're working with weights, of course, there's some equipment. Of course, if you belong to a gym, they can help you find a weightlifting and resistance exercise routine using their equipment that will get you started. And you can increase the weights as you improve. I also alternate between two other exercise videos one to strengthen the glutes, and another to tighten the abdominal muscles. I have beginner videos for each and intermediate level videos for each. The 12th bone health habit that's been great for me is doing balancing exercises. As we get older, falling is bad. This regular practice of doing balancing exercises helps to keep me from falling. There have been numerous times that I've caught myself and prevented a fall, all because I've strengthened the muscles from the obliques and abdominals to my knees. And I've added balancing, which focuses on starting at my feet and working its way up to my brain. Remember to do these exercises regularly and even working them into a daily routine. This is a good part of a daily habit. Habit number 13 is getting up early in the morning and not staying up late. I've read several studies which showed that the best, most restorative sleep we can get is the sleep we get before midnight. It has something to do with our circadian rhythm. I go to bed early and get up at five o'clock. I get my exercise in first thing and I have my prayer time afterward, all before getting on with the rest of my day. What really convinced me to be an early riser and to get my shut eye earlier in the evening are these studies about the sleep we get before midnight. Of course, getting seven to eight hours of sleep is important too, 
And if the first two or three hours of that is before midnight, it's even better. Make sure to check out the Kickstart Your Health course and all of the other links to studies, articles, and videos in the description box and in the first comment. Then check out one of my other videos by tapping its image on the right side of your screen, and I'll see you in the next video.